Hi, I am Mirko Böhm, an authorized Qt trainer from KDAB. Welcome to this learning video based on the material for the Qt Essentials training course. With these videos, we'll be giving you key insights into Qt. We will also demonstrate the type of in-depth training available in the classroom-based Qt Essentials training course. This video will be about signals and slots. Signals and slots are a concept that Qt is almost famous for. Many people have heard of it. We are going to cover how exactly they work and how you can program them. The general problem that we're trying to solve is how to connect an action that the user does in your application to some code being executed. For example, when the user clicks on a button, of course that means that your application needs to execute a certain piece of code. And how exactly this is done, th this is what we're going to talk about. Historically, there have been other solutions to the same problem, like callbacks. Callbacks had technical difficulties, for example, they were not type safe, and signals and slots do solve this problem for Qt. There are also other solutions like the observer pattern that are still in use today, but within Qt, you're mostly going to see signals and slots for higher level communication with the user, like pressing a button or, or moving a slider around with the mouse. And there are also events, Qt also uses events. These are for lower level interaction with the operating system or the user, like uh, keyboard clicks, for example. And events will be covered in a later video. In this video, we'll focus on signals and slots. When we're talking about signals and slots, we're always talking about communication between an explicit sender and an explicit receiver. The sender sends the, the signal and the receiver provides a slot in which the signal is received. Effectively, what we're implementing with that are type-safe callbacks. So we're still using callbacks, but in a way that fixes the problems that we have with callbacks in the past. When you get used to programming with signals and slots, they are easy to use, they are very flexible. For example, your classes don't really need to know exactly how to implement it as long as they know the names of the signals, so you can separate components much more. And they're definitely more secure than callbacks. So there are a lot of advantages in using signals and slots. There is a disadvantage though, and that is we need an external tool to generate code. That's the meta object compiler, and this will be shown later in this video. We're now going to look at how a signal slot connection can be made in a program, how it's typically used, and we're going to do that step by step in the following slides. If you look at the slide, you will see a slider object on the left and something that's called a spin box on the right. A spin box is a widget that shows one number and allows you to select a different number using the up and down keys. What we want to achieve is that when we move the slider around, we want the value of the spin box to change. A precondition is that we don't want to inherit neither the slider nor the spin box. We want to use these classes just as they are and only connect the, to the, the signal of the slider to the slot of the spin box. First of all, when the value of the slider is changed, when the slider is being moved, it emits a signal and this signal carries the current value as a parameter. What we want to achieve is for the spin box to receive this value. The spin box must provide a slot that can take this kind of parameter and react on it. So the slot that we're looking for in the spin box is something like set value to 42. What we then have to create between the signal and the slot is a connection. The connections are created at runtime. There's a statement for them, a line of code that needs to be executed to create this connection. It's called connect. Connect is a member function of QObject that takes usually four parameters. It's the sender, the signal, the receiver, and the slot. If you look at the connect statement listed here, then you will see that it contains two parameters that look like the signatures of the signal and the slot, including the variable integers in this case. When the signal is emitted, this integer will actually contain the real value that is used in the emit statement. So we're connecting the signal to the slot with these two parameters, but the actual value that is sent depends on the value that is set at the sending side um, at runtime. Um, you also see that this connect statement is executed at runtime, so there is nothing, there's no connection being made during compile time. 
And if that connect statement isn't executed, the connection doesn't exist. This is how the emit statement looks. What we need to achieve is for the slider to actually send out the new value. It needs to trigger the signal. That the process of triggering the signal is called emit. We're emitting the signal and we're actually passing the real value in it. It's effectively a function call. So we emit the value changed signal and the new value listed here is 42. What will now happen is that every slot that is connected to that signal will be called with exactly that value. In this case we have exactly one connection to the spin box, to the value, the set value slot. Now what happens in this slot is something we don't know. What we expect is that the, the spin box will set this new value and show it. So if you look at this all together you will see a sender with a signal and then receiver with a slot. The signal and the slot need to have matching parameters and a connection needs to be made. When the connection is made, the emit of the signal and the sending side will result in a call to the slot function on the receiving side. And the values that you pass into the emit call will be received on the, um, for the slot invocation. This is how signals and slot works. Remember that you will always need four parameters at least, sender, signal, receiver and slot, and you need to make the connection. Then you need to send the signal, and if all goes well, the slot will be called with your, the parameters that you have passed. We'll now look at a demo for the same example. What you're seeing here is the implementation of the example we have just walked through it theoretically. So the program when we run it is supposed to show the slider and the spin box and if we change the value of the slider, the spin box is supposed to change its value as well. As I said, we don't want to inherit the slider into a new class or the spin box to a new class. We just want to use existing ones. Our program looks very much like what we're used to by now. We're including a cute GUI header to get all these widget um, classes. R writing a main function, creating the queue application object, all as usual. We're then creating a new top-level window. It doesn't have a parent, so it's a top-level window. And we are creating a slider. The slider, get the last parameter of the slider constructor call is the window. So this, is, this slider is a sub-widget, a child widget of this window. It's a horizontal slider. This um, determines if the slider is moving left and right or up and down. We set the range to 0 to 100. These are the numbers that it will take. We create a spin box. The spin box is the one that shows this integer value and has the up and down buttons, also as a child of the window. And here's the interesting connect call. This is the essence of this whole exercise. So the connect call takes the slider and uses the signal, no, connects the signal value change with an integer parameter to the set value integer parameter slot of the spin box. Remember that only after we have executed these lines 15 and 16, the connection exists. So if the slider would emit the value change signal over here in line 10, the spin box would not get its slot called, only after this line has been executed. Then to make sure that the widgets are laid out properly, we are adding these two widgets, slider and spin box, to a horizontal box layout. And um, this layout will be automatically assigned to the window because that's the parameter to the layout's constructor. So this is the, wid the widget that it's managing. And here's an interesting bit. Now when we set the value of the slider to 40, this will already trigger a signal slot, um, a, a signal emission that will then result in a slot set value being called on the spin box. So when the program is starting, we expect the slider and the spin box to both have the value 40. We show the window and we execute the application. Let's do that. As expected, the window comes up and both of the widgets are showing 40. You have to take my word that the slider is actually at 40. Um, but if I now move the slide around, you see the program in action. So we have connected two user interface elements to each other. The, other, the spin box is reacting on value changes of the slider. We have not um, implemented our own class. We have not inherited any of the existing widgets. We have basically combined them into something more powerful than before.
If I change the value in the spin box, this will not change the value of the slider because the connection is only one way from the slider to the spin box. So if I change that here again, the spin box goes back to the value that the slider has. 0 to 99. This concludes this demo. So you have now seen the example that we have walked through earlier in real life. You see that it works and you see what it takes to create a signal slot connection in Qt. In this example you have seen how to use existing classes. We've used a Q slider and a Q spin box to connect a signal and a slot. Um, we haven't implemented our own classes and of course you will want to know how to add a slot to your own class or to how to add a signal to something, some widget that you implement. First of all, for your class to have, to have either slots or signals, it needs to inherit Q object. Q object is the base class that provides you with a signal slot mechanism. To add a slot, you then add a member function that has the name of the slot and the parameters, and you add that to a special section in your header file called public slots, as you see in the slide. To add a signal, you add a special section, section signals in your header file, and there you add member functions that will be the signals of your class. And then there is one very important um, line that you need to add to your, to your header file, and that is the Q underscore object macro also shown in this slide. This macro will mark this header file as some, a header file that implements signals and slots and needs to be passed by the meta object compiler and we'll talk about that in a second. Now, to implement a slot, you actually have to implement the member function. So, in this case, you need to go and implement the set value function. This is the function that will be called when your slot is called. It will be the slot. For in a signal, you don't really have to implement anything because the code for the signal is generated automatically by the meta object compiler. Um, and I will show that in a second. The only thing you need to do to emit a signal is write that line emit signal name parameters. The code for the signal will be generated. So now you might be wondering what this q underscore object macro does in our header file. I said that it will mark the header file for being processed by the meta object compiler and I haven't explained what the meta object compiler is until now. The meta object compiler, mock, comes with your Q source code, with your Q installation, and is executed during the build process. It looks at your header file and it generates the implementation of the signals and something called the meta object for this class. This meta object contains a lot of static information about what kinds of signals and slots your class has. And um, this code that is generated by the mock will be compiled just as regular C++ code or becomes a part of your application. So effectively it becomes a part of the implementation of your class. So your class now consists of the header file, the C++ code that you wrote by yourself, and also of the C++ code that is generated by the mock. This means that there are three steps involved to get that code into your application. First of all, you need to call the mock on the header file so that it generates the C++ code. Then you need to add this code to your application, so you have to compile this file, and you have to link this file into your application. If you're building your projects with QMake, this is all done automatically. Um, the only thing you have to do is list your header file in the headers section of the project file. And if you're using Qt Creator to, to develop your software, then it will also automatically manage these things for you. So if you're wondering what kind of code the meta object compiler is generating, I have already mentioned the meta object itself and the signals and slots. The meta object is accessible in your, in your class through the function meta object. It provides things like your class name and it allows you to uh, determine what kind of classes you're inheriting, for example. It also allows you to see what signals and slots or dynamic properties your class has. So all the functionality added by the Qt object model to your class is available through the meta object. And if you want to really understand in detail how this works, it's not necessary to understand this to develop with Qt, but if you want to understand how it really works, it might make sense to look at the mock generated files maybe once and read the C++ code in there. Um, you will also see why you do not want to, to write this code by hand and rather have it generated by a tool. Now if you think back to the beginning of this video, the question we asked was how do we react to some action that the users take in our program. We want some code to be called. And the example we used was, what if the user clicks a button and I want a function to be called? 
And the solution that we are offering in Qt, or that we're using in Qt, is you need a slot that can be called, and you need to connect that slot to the signal of the class where the user clicks on or selects something or changes a property. You need to write that connect statement, remember the four parameters, and then when the user clicks a button, your function will be called. These are signal slot connections. This is a very basic mechanism in Qt, and now you know how it works. We hope that you enjoyed this taste of the Qt Essentials training. For the full experience, including labs, Q's, and Q&As, and additional information, we recommend that you attend the full multi-day Qt Essentials training course. The course is available from KDAB or any of the other Qt training partners. For full information, check out qt.nokia.com. Thanks for watching.